Okay, uh, this is the kind of last lecture that we're going to have uh, this semester. And the last thing I was going to get covered uh, today was kind of uh, a brief, quick introduction to Python network programming for games. Uh, and I will post the example code from this to the course page uh, after we're done here today as well. But essentially what we want is if you're working on a game for your project, or you have some other game idea that maybe you could make multiplayer, uh, but don't know how yet. Hopefully today we're going to answer some of those uh, questions, and I'm going to show you how to uh, do at least the beginnings of a network uh, game here. All right. So first off, uh, to make a networked multiplayer game, we're going to need to write uh, our code. And we need to write that code so that it can send data uh, across the network, it should say, instead of of the network, say across the network there. Um, but network programming uh, is achieved using the sockets module. And the sockets module is kind of a standard module. Uh, in fact, sockets are the technology that kind of underpins the entire way that the internet is programmed. So web servers, web browsers, uh, any other uh, tool that you use, like maybe you use like the uh, Discord app, uh, anything that talks over the network uses sockets in some way. And to use that in Python, super simple, we just say import sockets. Uh, and the sockets module basically is what's going to allow us to send data over one of these uh, IP networks. And an IP network is kind of uh, part of the TCP IP suite. That's the uh, underlying addressing and routing system that pretty much makes the entire internet work. Now, there are two different ways to communicate over uh, IP, and IP just stands for Internet Protocol. Uh, so there are two different ways to communicate over those Internet Protocol networks, and those are called TCP uh, and UDP. And we're going to quickly talk about the difference between those. We're not going to go into too low-level details. You'll see more low-level details in future classes in the uh, degree. But let's go ahead and look at those two uh, with respect to each other. So TCP is kind of a, what's called transport control protocol. Sometimes it's also called transmission control protocol. And UDP is called, or stands for Universal Datagram Protocol. And the big difference between those is that TCP kind of guarantees the reliable transfer. In other words, it's uh, kind of session-based. So in other words, with TCP, it's kind of like making a phone call. You call up one of these other servers, they uh, accept your connection, once you're connected, you can send data through. TCP is going to guarantee that the data gets through. So when it says it was sent, we know that it was received. And on the receiving side, it makes sure that what was received exactly matches what's sent. But the problem with that is there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that we have no control over, including that uh, it's having to kind of divide up those streams of data into these smaller packets, send them, put them back together on the other end. If chunks are missing, it's got to re-request them. And so the end result of that is that because it's doing a lot of that uh, error checking and uh, kind of verification for us, that that can be slow. It can also translate to an unresponsive behavior in a game server, that we move a second later, something happens. And it might not always be a second. Sometimes it might be fast, sometimes it might be slow, but we don't have any control over it because TCP behind the scenes is doing kind of the verification and transfer of data and the sequencing of the data, and we don't really have control over that. Now UDP, on the other hand, is unreliable, meaning that we send these little packets of data and they get to the other end, or sometimes they don't, but there's no verification, there's no uh, re-requesting things that got lost. But the advantage of UDP is it's fast, uh, because it's not doing all that extra processing and verification and uh, acknowledgement and all of the other th handshaking, uh, flow control, it's not doing any of it. It's just kind of like delivering letters from one machine to another machine. But because of that, it can be fast. Because it's simple, it can be fast. And it can also make for games that are very responsive. But both of them, uh, both TCP and UDP, essentially use these little datagram messages, these little kind of packets of information going across the network uh, to address and route those things. So one of them... TCP adds this whole extra layer of verification and sequencing and re-requesting where UDP is just the raw kind of datagrams going across the network. So let's look at each one in a little bit more detail. 
All right, so TCP, uh, the concept of that is it manages a connection. We have to make a connection. Uh, the other end has to accept that connection. Once we have the connection created, we can have this conversation with putting data in, pulling data out, communicating from one end to the other end, or from the other end back. And then we're done, we close that connection down. Think of TCP like a phone call, that we call somebody, they answer the phone, we know they've answered, we send a message, they say, okay, I got it. Uh, they give us an answer back, we say, okay, I got your answer back, and then we say, okay, I'm done talking, bye, goodbye. So think of TCP like a phone call. It guarantees reliability and the sequence of the message, just, uh, the integrity of the stream, and it does so by automatically dividing that long stream of data, ongoing stream of data into these individual data, message datagrams, and then automatically putting them back together on the other end. Uh, it also will automatically adjust for varying connection speeds. It'll speed up when it can, slow down when it needs to. Um, but it's really easy to use where we can send data. If it says that it was sent, we know it was received. Uh, and if we receive the data, we know that it exactly matches what was sent. But that comes at a cost of all of the processing needed to manage all of that stuff for us. UDP, on the other hand, is a little bit different in that it doesn't have the concept of connections. It's just individual message datagrams going through. It doesn't guarantee delivery. It doesn't guarantee the order of delivery. So if I sent packet one, two, three, they could be received in a different order. They could be received in two, three, one, or two, one, three, or three, two, one, or three, one, two, or, or one, two, three. Uh, generally, they'll be received in a similar order to that they were sent, but there's no guarantee of that. There's also no guarantee that if I send one datagram, say, hey, this is message one, it could be received two or three or more times on the other end, or no times on the other end. So it's not reliable at all in the sense that TCP is. Now, there are no streams. It's just datagram messages. You can think of those as kind of like an envelope with data stuffed in it. And we get it, we open the envelope, we can pull the data out of it. Some messages will get lost. Some of them will come in in a different order. But it's just the kind of buckets of information, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so it also doesn't adjust for connection speed variance, uh, so we'll have to do that ourselves if we want to. Also, uh, if lost messages, sequencing, duplicates, uh, we'll have to deal with that ourselves. And we should probably add our own checksum uh, in our actual data if we want to verify the integrity of it. Although there are checksums in Ethernet and IP uh, or UDP has a checksum, so maybe we don't need to do that. Uh, it's not quite as important. It's unlikely that uh, an error packet will make it through, but if we want to absolutely guarantee our integrity of our data, we should add our own check value. All right, so given all that, looking at the two things, TCP er, seems reliable, and it guarantees the integrity of the stream. UDP, however, uh, does not is not reliable, and it does not guarantee the integrity of the stream. There is no stream. It's just individual things. So TCP seems better, uh, but the TCP has some problems. First off, TCP will queue up data until a larger data grows ready. In other words, if we send a really small message, uh, the message size is relatively short, then what's going to end up happening is TCP is going to decide that's not enough data in the stream yet to send a packet, so I'll wait a little while. And at that timeout, uh, the time it takes before it decides, okay, well, I didn't get any more data, I'll go ahead and send what I have, that can delay things in our game. Now, we can actually turn that off. Uh, by turning it what's called TCP no delay mode, which means that as soon as it gets any data, it'll send it. But that still doesn't really completely solve the issue, because even with that uh, no delay uh, activated, or, or the delay turned off, it can still be really slow, because it automatically, if it misses something, it automatically resends it. It also uh, will... Um, only resend uh, packets if they have not been acknowledged, and if we lose the acknowledgement, then we could have to resend, and the resend could be lost too. So we can get up to like a uh, a latency of like a half second or even longer on a TCP connection with packets get lost. And notice that for a real time game where you need to somebody's in your uh, crosshairs, you need to shoot or you need to react and dodge something, a half a second in kind of game time is really poor. And if you think about there being this round trip latency there, the time it takes you to send out the data, data, the time it takes for the data to come back, we're talking about really uh, poor performance for real-time behavior. 
So TCP can work great uh, for uh, certain kinds of things, like a role-playing uh, game where it's turn-based. You make a choice, you send the message. It doesn't matter if we're uh, a quarter or a half second delayed because it's our turn. The other thing uh, that can be useful for is sending game assets like levels and textures and skins and sounds and any other asset uh, that we need. Transferring those can be really simplified over TCP because it'll guarantee the integrity of all those things. But for real-time kind of first-person shooter, Twitch kind of games, TCP is really an awful choice just because the real-time data is going to be have such uh, delays and we don't can't really make this any faster. It just works the way that it does. We can't really make these things go any faster uh, than they go. So we have no control over those delays, and very little control over it. Then that can be a problem. So we're going to focus on uh, UDP. So things like first-person shooters or real-time strategy games, UDP is really necessary. It has to be what we use. And the reason why TCP, we just don't have control over the latency. And those latencies like that can make a game unplayable or, at best, uh, really frustrating and sluggish and not responsive at all. All right, so we're going to use a client-server architecture for this. And the, the things that we want, we want quick updates of inputs from players. So when a player presses a key, we want it to very quickly have an uh, impact on the game. When the player releases a key, we want it to very quickly know that as well. So server is going to receive those inputs from the player and it's going to update the game state based on their actions. Uh, the server is then going to send out the entire game state back to the clients. The clients are going to update their local variables and then render what the game looks like to the uh, to the screen. So think about the client machine here being kind of like this, uh, just a stand in for you press a key, it tells the server what key was pressed, the server updates, the game state sends the game state back, and then the client renders it. So they're client machine at this point, rather than running all the logic to the game, is really just saying, take the input from the user, get the data from the server, render on the screen. What So it becomes like an uh, input gathering, transmitting, uh, game state receiving, rendering uh, kind of model for this uh, client. The server is going to be accepting those inputs from the different users, updating stuff about the game state based on that input, and then sending the game state out to every one of the clients that's currently connected. So because uh, UDP has those problems, we're going to have to think some things through. We're going to have to program around those shortcomings of being unreliable. OK, now the UDP datagram structure, I don't want to get too far into the weeds uh, in this class on how this thing is set up. But there is something that's important uh, to note here. The first thing to note is that it does have a checksum. And it does have this length. But the highest uh, number of bytes we can send in one UDP packet is 65,507. And the reason for that is that this UDP datagram has to go into a UDP packet that has an 8-byte header, which is this 8 bytes here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So these are, these are 16 bits. So there's 8 bytes there. And it also has to then be wrapped inside of an IP header that has the internet uh, IP address. Uh, and other information associated with the IP header. So the biggest packet we, or UDP datagram we could ever have is 65,507. But there's a, a further problem there on that size, and that is that uh, large UDP datagrams can prove problematic. And the reason is because IP packets that big that are up to the 60, total of 65,535 when you add the headers, uh, the UDP header and the IP header, that can be a problem because uh, IP networks are kind of like a, you can think of it like a logical networking scheme, but a physical network like Ethernet or Wi-Fi can't handle datagrams as large as this. So what happens is IP has a way to do what's called fragmenting those datagrams into packets, and then it reassembles them on the other end. Now, this is not the same as the uh, dividing things up for stream data over TCP. This is just taking this big message. It says, hey, I can't fit 65,000 507 bytes into a single Ethernet data frame to go over my wired connection or Wi-Fi connection. So I need to uh, divide that up into what are called fragments. And let's just take a really quick look at how the fragments work. So if I were to send a 3,000 byte datagram 
it would end up being divided across three different IP uh, datagrams. The first one would have the header and then uh, as many of the data bytes as we could fit. The next one is going to have the next data bytes, and the last one's going to have the remaining ones. So if you add up 1472, 1480, and 48, you'll get 3000 out of that. So that's how, but notice that three of those. Now the problem comes in is that all these will get stuck back together on the receiving end. But what happens if one of these datagrams gets lost? So if one of these datagrams gets lost and we don't have it anymore, then there really remember that UDP has no way of re requesting things that were missing automatically. So if one of these gets lost, what UDP does, it just throws the entire thing away. So if I lose just this last 48 bytes here out of all of these, then I throw away everything that I did get. I just uh, discard it. And so that means that if I were to have a 65,507 byte datagram, that'll have 45 fragments. Oops. And the odds of one of those getting lost would be relatively high. So we could have a lot of the data we're trying to transfer never make it through to the other end. So the ideal thing is to limit the game server datagrams to be this uh, size 1,476 because of that 1,500 byte uh, limit on the uh, number of um, bytes that we can stick into an Ethernet packet. And that can be uh something we're gonna have to worry about so in our game server if we can limit our datagrams to 1476 bytes each then that's going to improve our performance a lot and we might go to two uh for using two of these fragments uh but we don't really want to get it to the point where we're using like 45 fragments because we're never going to get any data through with packets getting lost uh here and there we're going to get very few of them through so if possible we want to limit the game server datagrams to uh less than or equal to 1,476 bytes. All right, now, to focus on uh, UDP, uh, why are we focusing on that? Because even though it's unreliable, it's fast. And we're just gonna make our the way we use it so that its shortcomings are kind of not a problem for our game server. The other thing what we're gonna try to do is limit our datagrams to being less than or equal to that uh, ethernet uh, MTU, which is MTU stands for maximum transmission unit, but that we want to be less than or equal to this amount of bytes. So we're going to try to do that so we don't get fragmentation. That's going to improve performance for us as well. And even though we're going to do that, uh, UDP can still lose datagrams. So we should probably consider that. And also note, if we just need a reliable way to transfer files, we should probably use TCP. But if we want a high-speed, real-time uh, game server, UDP is the way to go. All right, so let's uh, look quickly at how UDP programming works. The first thing is we're going to need to import socket. That's easy to do. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a socket object, so socket.socket. .socket. And now the two parameters we need to create a UDP socket are AF underscore INET, so socket.AF underscore INET. And what that is is that's the address family for IPv4 networks or Internet. Uh, address family. And then the second thing, sock, uh, socket dot sock underscore dgram, that's saying UDP, that's saying make it this type of connection, a datagram connection. The alternative to this, if you wanted a TCP socket, would be sock underscore stream. So it's either streamed connection or a datagram connection. We're choosing datagram because we want it to be faster. The next thing that I do here is I take that client socket and I set it to so it's non-blocking. And what blocking means is when I try to read data from that socket, if I've the if I don't set it to non-blocking, it'll stop and wait for a datagram to come in, and then it will process it and then go on. But in most cases with game servers, we're going to be receiving datagrams from a variety of different uh, clients, and we don't want to freeze the entire game simulation running if we don't have a like a keyboard message or something coming in. So we don't want to block and wait. We just want to say, hey, is there a message? If, in other words, we're checking the mailbox and saying, if there's nothing in the mailbox, go ahead and go on. But if there is something in the mailbox, pull it out and do something with it. So that way the game can progress. The bullets will still move. The players will still move. Anything that's going on in the game world, will, the time will continue to count. We want stuff to continue going. So to do that, we're just going to turn off blocking on that socket. The next thing is the address we want to connect to. 
Uh, and here, you could replace this with the IP address of your machine, but this is the port number we're going to list on. And port numbers are really kind of like a phone extension. So we're saying on this machine at this address, you use this phone extension, and that's the one that we're going to connect to. So this is the server address. That's the one we're about to connect to. And one quick note, if you want to test things on your local machine, this address here, 127.0.0.1, that's a special address called the local host. That means, hey, connect to my machine, the one that I'm on right now. But if you were to connect, want to connect to a remote server, you would just put the IP address of that remote server uh, in place of that address. Okay, so after this, we're now ready to start sending and receiving datagrams. We've created a socket, we've set it to unblocking, and we have this address as the one that we're going to connect to. So this is who we're going to try to call. Or this, in other words, this is the address we're going to write on the outside of the envelopes that we're going to send. Okay, so to send data, we basically just use that socket that we created and use this dot send to function. And the way that works is we basically just send the message and we send it to the address we set. So in other words, I'm saying this is the contents of the envelope. This is the address I'm putting on the outside of it. And notice in this case, I'm sending this message, hello, Watson. Notice I had to encode it as UTF-8. That's because Python internally uses uh, Unicode strings and I converted it into kind of normal ASCII before I sent that message. Now on the receiving end, to receive the data, we it kind of does the opposite. We're going to use receive from. This is the maximum size that we want to receive, so we can limit how much we'll receive uh, as a maximum size. But what happens to this, notice when we did a send to, we said here's the message, here's the address. When we get a receive and a message comes in, it says here's the message we got and here's the address it came from. So we can see the message and who it came. In other words, we got a letter in the mail. I can look at the address on the outside and see who it came from, the return address, or I could look at the open it and look at the contents of it. Now, one interesting thing is you notice I have this in this try accept block here. And the reason I did that is because I turned off the blocking behavior for receive from. What happens with a receive from if you try to read from it? and it's set to non-blocking, it throws an exception saying no data is available. So we're going to catch that exception. So in other words, if I try to receive from this and there's nothing available, it'll jump down here and set the message to none and the address to none. In other words, if I get past this and I have a message of none, nothing came in. But if I get here and the message is not none, then I know I got something on the socket and then I can process it. Okay, now in that previous example, this one back here, we just sent this kind of string, and we did encode it, but not in a careful way. But a lot of times in a game, we want to send game data for some kind of game object, not just a string like back here that says, like, hello, Watson. We want to send uh, an actual uh, game object across the network. And so to do that, we're going to want to encode uh, the message when we send it, and we're going to want to decode it when we receive the data. And previously in the last lecture, uh, the one on file IO or storing complex data in files, we looked at a number of ways to serialize data. Uh, we looked at Pickle. We looked at doing it ourselves, kind of custom programming it. We looked at, uh, talked about XML and JSON. We also talked about this uh, more compact thing called message pack. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. So in other words, I'm going to take a game object. So anything on my game, a dictionary, a list, uh, a list of dictionaries, a dictionary full of lists, uh, strings, whatever we want, we can put them into this uh, function, message pack.dumps. It's going to convert that into a string of bytes, a byte array, and then that's what I'm going to send over the network. And on the receiving end, when I receive it, I'm going to get the message, and then I'm going to take that and turn it back into an object by unpacking uh, that thing with message pack.loads instead of dumps. So I take the message it came in, and then I have the message object, and then I can process that um, if an object came in. So in other words, I could stuff a list into here. It'll serialize it. It'll send it. The receiver will get it. It'll deserialize it. And then that list will pop out the other end. So we have or a dictionary or whatever we want to send. So this gives us a really convenient way to move an object from one machine, encode it, send it, decode it, and now we have that object back on the other end. And you don't have to use Message Packer. You could use Pickle. Uh, you could use JSON. 
Uh, you should have your own custom thing that creates a string from your uh, message, however you want to do it. But the idea here is pretty simple. We can feed any game object in now. It'll send it to the other end and we'll get it. All right, so let's look at just a quick little bit of code here. We looked at this before. So here, setting up the socket, we already saw that. Sending a message, receiving a message, and then what we can do now is say, if the message that came out of this was not none, then we're going to go ahead and process it. And we would write the code for how, what we want to do with that message. And on the server side, it's the same process. There's one difference, though. On the server side, we have to oops, add this one line here, this server socket.bind, and that's so that that server can start accepting data coming in on that, uh, that port that we specified. But receiving a message looks the same. Uh, processing a message that came in will look the same. Sending a message will look the same. OK, so the basic idea here is uh, we need to decide on what those messages look like. So the basic idea of the protocol is the client uh, does some kind of IO on their game. We send the input and control events from the client to the server. So we're going to need some kind of protocol to what do those events look like? How do we make those uh, messages uh, to send them and then decode them on the other end? Now, the server is then going to update its game state based on the client input, and, and then it's going to send back out the game state information back to the client. The client's going to receive the new game state information from the server, uh, and then it's going to render that on the screen, and it's going to keep repeating that process over and over. Get input send the input to the server, server updates the game, sends out the game state, we receive that, we render it, and just kind of repeat that process. Now, one other thing the server is going to need to be able to handle is have players joining the game. If it's a multiplayer game, uh, we're also going to have to have uh, a table of uh, currently connected player addresses. Uh, in other words, who, excuse me, when the players join, we need to keep track of who's currently in the game because we need to send them the game state information. We just send everybody who's currently part of the game the new game state. And then we're going to have to have a way for players to exit the game or be timed out and kicked out of the player table automatically. Now, the client messages and the game state need to be encoded in some way. Uh, we talked about a number of ways of doing that last time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, use message pack, though. And the reason for that, it's more compact than JSON and Pickle and XML. And it's also fast and language independent, meaning that we could make a eventually a C++ or C Sharp client or a C language server to make it faster. Uh, and message pack being language independent is a better choice than Pickle. But you could use Pickle or JSON or any of these other ones if you wanted to. OK, so here's what we're going to build. We're going to make a client ga uh, game client loop that gets user events, sends them to the server in a UDP packet. Uh, if data then arrives from the server, we're going to receive the game state packet and update all our local variables and by processing that packet. And then we're going to render to the display. On the game server, we're going to receive client events. If a client joins, we add them to our internal table. If the client exits, they get removed from the table. And all of the other events we just process to move them or update their position or do whatever action they told us they were doing. And then uh, we update the kind of game variables uh, by continuing with the simulation process. And then after that, we're going to send the game state UDP packets out to all the clients that are in this client table that we have. Now, there are some things that we should consider though that could be problems for us, and those are Events could get lost. Remember, UDP is not reliable, so events could be lost or received out of order. Another thing, they could be duplicated. Also, the game state responses going back from the server to the client, those could be lost or received out of order. So different game event types uh, have to be sent, and maybe all of them would have to be sent together as one group. Uh, in other words, they clicked on the mouse, they pressed this key on the keyboard, we might need to send a single data frame that has hey, they did this and this and this all at the same time. Also, the gif different game state updates are going to have to be repeatedly sent from the server. And we have to be careful that the game state doesn't get too large because we don't want to, we really want to try to avoid fragmentation if possible. And then we want the whole process to be quick 
and feel uh, responsive. All right, so to begin making this protocol, uh, we need to pin down the protocol messages that we're going to be using uh, when we send stuff. All right, so here's what I came up with uh, for a really quick uh, kind of overview of what we're talking about here. And really, depending on the kind of game or what you're doing, you could add more to this. But from the client to the server, I imagine you have a key down event. When somebody presses a key down, that sends a thing to the server, key up. When somebody releases a key, uh, joining the game at the beginning, exiting the game when we quit. And then there's a thing called a keep alive message. That means that well, if I'm not touching any other keys, I still will periodically send a ping to the server saying, hey, I'm still here. I'm still here. Even though this player isn't hitting keys or doing anything, I'm still here. And the reason for that is on the server, it can be useful that if a player accidentally gets disconnected or disappears from the game for some reason, their program crashes, their network goes down. We don't want to continue trying to send them data and slowing down the rest of the gameplay. So we might get rid of them if we haven't heard anything from them for, I don't know, two seconds, five seconds, however long we want to, uh, before we automatically remove them from the uh, game. Now, from the server to client, we need to send the game state information, and that could be the player list of, uh, these are all the players that are currently in the game. These are their X, Y positions and their speed and their colors and their scores and their health. We could send all of that stuff out we also might send out if there are bullets in the game, all of the bullets. Here's the X, here's the Y, here's the uh, direction, here's the speed of those things. We might also send out if we have items like health kits or uh, treasures or uh, weapons that can be picked up. We might send out a list of where all those are. And there might be other data that we might want to send too, like how much time is left in the round, how many... Um, uh, Items do you currently have in your inventory? There could be other stuff that would get sent out uh, to the um, to each of the clients. Now, again, we should work to keep our size of the uh, game state below that 1476 bytes mark to avoid fragmentation. Now, if we do get to the point where it's very large, what I would suggest doing is rather than letting UDP fragment for us, divide this up into here's the player list update. Uh, datagram. Here's the bullet list update datagram. Here's the item list. Because if one of those gets lost, the other ones could get through. Where if I do it all in a larger uh, UDP datagram and it fragments it, if one of those fragments gets lost, the whole thing gets discarded. All right. So anyway, uh, continuing on here, a couple things to consider. We need to plan for uh, lost packets. In other words, if we go back and look at this list of things, imagine the key down message could get lost which in that case, they press their key, their player doesn't move, it stays still. But also the key up uh, message could get lost. In that case, they're pressing the key, they're running through the map, they let off the key. In the network game, the player keeps running, but they're not touching the keyboard at all. So those are the kinds of things that can happen with UDP that we gotta be careful of. A couple other things, uh, we could lose game state packets, uh, or packets could res rely or arrive out of order which would mean that you have something moving across your screen, it jumps back and then it jumps forward, uh, or it kind of jitters around because the packets are getting shuffled up. And that doesn't tend to happen a lot, but it could. And so we need to maybe plan for that to happen. Also, users dropping, their network goes down, their program crashes, uh, their mom comes in their room and unplugs their uh, internet because they're not, uh, they're a teenager and they're not doing their laundry or whatever. Uh, but if a player drops out, we should have a way to auto-remove them from the game. Also, uh, or if it's a two-player game and they're required to continue, maybe we pause everything and wait for them to rejoin or something like that. Now, also, uh, there might be certain kinds of packets that need to be acknowledged. I mean, we might need to say, hey, I got your message. We're cool now. And those might be things like join messages uh, or anything else that's kind of critical for us to get. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, quickly look at a little bit of code here. And the code that I want to look at, uh, that is not what I want to go to. This is what I want to go to. All right, so what I did for this code is I'm going to start on the client side, but I created kind of a class to act as a helper. And actually, uh, before I do that, let me go back to this for just a second. That Let, let me talk about what the, how that class is set up. So to simplify things for us, 
I made these classes that are going to do some of the work for us. And the idea there is uh, inside of that class, we're going to have a client class and a server class. And on the client and the server, they're both going to open and manage the socket for us. So managing that socket for us uh, is going to be, and here I switched this the wrong way. Let me switch it back to you. that. All right, so they're going to open and manage the socket for us. It's also going to have a method to send Python objects, meaning that we're going to build into the class kind of the encoding mechanism. And when we receive objects, we're going to have a decoding mechanism. Additionally, it's uh, I think it's useful to label what kind of message it is or what kind of object it is. So you might send key state uh, as a label. In other words, we don't just want to send an object through and then have it pull out on the other end because we don't know what kind of object that is. This will give us an idea of, okay, what does that object mean to the game? Is this a bullet list or a player list or is this a, a key down uh, event or is this a join the game kind of event? And so this adding this label gives us a way to kind of annotate those objects as we send them through saying, here's an object and here's what that object is or what it does for this game. So that's going to allow us to kind of transparently push objects into the send, have them pop out of the receive on the other end, along with a label that says what the identity or what the use of that object is uh, for the game. All right, so here's kind of a picture of that, that here's the network uh, instance object. Here's a server object. So we have a client object, a server object. These would be on different machines. Uh, this would be on the server. This is on the client, obviously. So if they we want to send this key down A event, we would stick that into here. The name would be key down, the item or the value associated with the A. And so when that pops out on the other end, we're going to pop, have that pop out as, hey, a key down event happened, and it's the letter A uh, on the receiving end. Also on the receiving end, there's something that's missing from my diagram here. And that is we're also going to know what address it came from. We're going to know who sent the letter or key down letter A, which of the clients sent that. And then we're going to form a response as a game state. We're going to push that in with the name being game state, the item being whatever variable dictionary list or whatever has all the game state information in it. I'd recommend dictionaries. We push that in, that pops out the other end, and the game state pops out uh, over here along with the name being game state and the item being whatever was in that dictionary that we sent. So in other words, you can see the process here. We're just going to use these objects and say, hey, send this object with this name. When it, this receives it, it pops out and says, hey, I got that object with that name. And then we can do something on the server about that. All right, so let's go back and look at our code now, like we said. So I'm going to switch that over back to here. All right, so the client side, notice that there's not much code here for uh, the object we're talking about. And all it really does is it says, OK, make this client in the constructor, pass it an address and a port. We create the socket, set it to non-blocking, set up the address. Uh, and now we're ready to go. We're ready to send stuff because we know the address of who we're going to send things to. That's part of the client object. And then all I have is a send object method. And again, I pass in a name and the uh, object we want to be uh, sent. And what, notice that inside the methods, method, it combines the name and the item into a tuple for us. So you'll notice it doing it right here, or right there. It's combining those into a tuple. And then it's encoding that in a message pack uh, string. That's what we're going to send. And where are we going to send it? We're going to send it to the destination address, the machine that we uh, configured this client to talk to. So really simple there. And if something comes back, we have this get object. And what I'm doing there is I'm just saying, hey, whatever comes back, I'm going to get the uh, message and address back from that. Uh, and this message is the raw version that hasn't been decoded. So I pull the name um, out of message sub zero. And then I do a message pack that loads of message sub one to get that message that comes in. And actually, this is a little bit wrong the way we have that here. I, I, I'm not receiving anything in this end. So let me fix that code uh, really quickly. It needs to look like the code down here. So that way I have this fixed before we post it. All right, so there we go. So in other words, 
uh, we re whatever we received as the message, we now unpack it, and now it's in a tuple that has the two parts just like we stuck in. The name is the first part, the item value, uh, the object is the second part, and then we return those. Now, if something happened where there wasn't a packet to be received, then we jumped in here and just returned none. Okay, the server side pretty much looks the same, except for on the server side we have to have this bind line here. But these two really look the same. They don't do anything different. So really, the only difference between the server side and the uh, client side is this one is not going to be connecting to uh, or sending data to things. There's one other difference here as well, and that is notice on the server side we need to say a destination address. Who are we sending this to? And we're passing that to the send object uh, method. And that's because the server needs to talk to multiple clients. The client only having to talk to one server, we could store that in the client list. But over here, we need to specify what one of the destinations we want to send that object to. All right, so let's look at the main program down here in the client. And notice this is relatively small. What I did is I basically just say receive a keyboard event. Uh, if it's a key down event, then notice what I'm doing is I'm sending well, if I got an escape, then I exit the game. Otherwise, I go ahead and send a message. I named it with the name field, kind of the tag, key underscore DN. And then I send the actual key, the character that is the key that was actually pressed. And then if a key up event happens, I send a key up tag message with whatever the object is here that comes back from that, which is going to be a string that has, again, the key that was released. And that's it. We're not doing anything else in here. Uh, this is not a full working game. But notice in here, we would probably then in our game call uh, the function to, uh, in this case, um, I don't know why that slide seven thing is in the way there. That's left over from some other program here. Let me see. All right. Well, I don't know why that's stuck on the screen there. Uh, let's just kind of work around it, I guess. But that. Let me move up so we can see that. But we would essentially call net client dot get object there. If it returned none, we would try again later. If it didn't return none, we would process that event, pull the game state out of that get object. Uh, if game state was the object type that came through, and then we would update some variables. And then down here we just render everything to the screen and then repeat that. So in other words, get input, send input as necessary uh, as events, and then receive the game state, render the game, and repeat that. So there's a lot of logic here left out of this to make it an actual game, but we should actually see this thing working. Now on the server side, I don't even have any kind of graphics or anything over here. I'm just basically saying, here's my server loop. And what I'm doing here is I'm getting an object. Uh, if there is one, in other words, if the name was something other than none, then I print out who I got the message or what the message I got was, what the object was associated with it, and then who it came from, what address it came from. Now, in the real world, uh, to make this a full server, we'd have to receive that object, look at the type of object it was, I mean, what name was it, if it was key down, do this, if it was key up, do this, uh, if it was join, do this, if it was exit, do this. So we would have to add uh, kind of a big if, else if, else if, else if on the name of things and then do something with those objects to update the game. We would then move all of them, and then we would go through and send out the new game state to all the clients that were currently connected. Now, just uh, for fun, let's go ahead and run this uh, and see this uh, up and working. So I just ran the server. Let me move that onto the screen here so we can see it. Let me make it smaller. So, so notice that the server is now ready. Now, right now, that server main loop is running, but no data is coming in. So in other words, this program back here is running, but it has not. It's basically just over and over again. Let me move this out of the way. Over and over again, it's just calling get object, which nothing has come in, so it's returning none. And we're just saying that. Now, I'm going to go ahead and run the uh, client program now. And you'll notice the first thing uh, that we saw happen there was you'll notice that we did get a message. Let me move this so these are side by side so we can see this down here too. But you'll notice we got this message, connect from that client, came in on our server here. And that's because in the program over here, before it enters the loop, notice it said send object connect client. So we set up the client object. We then The first thing we did is send a connect thing, and that's what came through here. 
And notice when this received it, it said, hey, I got a connect request from this address on that port number. All right, so let's go back to that program for just a second. So here's the program. And I'm not really drawing anything right now, but I am getting those inputs. So notice if I press the letter A over on, and I released it also, notice on the server side, we got the key down event on the server. So notice as I press different keys, spacebar, T, hello. And you can see it kind of spelling out the word hello. So that's passing through those events uh, to the server. And if I escape from this program, if I get out of the game, you'll notice it sends the disconnect message. And back in our code, notice that's what it is. It said connect before the main loop. Every time they press a key or release a key, send an event. And at the end of the day, uh, disconnect from the entire uh, thing once we're done with the game. And notice the server got all of those over here. All right, so that's kind of the basis uh, for what we're going to do. And you'll notice in the code uh, on this end, um, you'll notice that I did add like a player list and a bullet list. So if you want to experiment with sending those back across, you can and receiving them over here. I kind of added them in here. But notice what's cool about the way we did this is one of the things that I like to do, and I kind of illustrated this here, is I like to make a dictionary that has all of the items in it. Because a dictionary, remember, has kind of a key, a key value pair that are associated with each other. And by associating the key value pair with one another, we can do things that are fairly complex. Like in this case, I'm associating the key player list as a string with this entire list of things up here. And then the bullet list, I'm associating the word bullet list with all of these things up here. And so I could put those into one object, this game state dictionary, and just send that across to the other end with the tag game state. And when I receive that on the other end, it's going to come through the dictionary that has a player list field or key with this data in it, a bullet list key with that data in it. So I would just have to pull those out and make bullets that match these positions, make players that match these, and then render those on the screen. So the ability of these kind of socket uh, client and server classes that we made up here to do this conversion of an object with a name associated with it into that message, send it, and then decode it on the other end is really powerful because we can make a game, a single dictionary that has everything about the game state that we would want to send or receive send the whole thing as one object, receive it as one whole object, and then just render that onto the screen. So relatively uh, straightforward. Now let's look at one final example uh, set of code here. So I will post these to the web page so you can play with them. These are kind of boiled down to these simple objects uh, that you could use in your own code. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the server, or the thing that you need to connect to when you create this, this is going to need to match the machine. I have it on localhost because I'm testing it all on the same machine, but you could just change that IP address. Also the port numbers here, uh, you could use other port numbers. Uh, port numbers uh, can be a wide range of values. One thing to keep in mind though is stay away from uh, commonly used port numbers, like for example port 80 is used for HTTP for uh, web pages and stuff like that. Uh, but if you pick one up in the several thousands, like I just randomly picked 12,000, uh, that happen to be available on my server machine so it works but if you get an error when you run your server and it says the port is not available there could be some service already running on your machine using that port so just use a different port number all right let's look at one final example here and i'm going to load up some different programs for this but these work using the same concept all right so this is the client side i'm going to open up this uh, UDP client three on that side. And let me move this over the top of that guy. And let me close the old one. And make this a little bigger. Actually, let me just grab that and move it there. Okay, so there's and this is called three because I wrote a couple other ones before this one. And let me open the server, UDP server three. And let me dock that right there. 
Okay, now this is a little more complex. This is more of a full game that both the client and the server uh, are using Pygame. They're going to draw some stuff on the screen. And here I have a player client, which is doing something similar to what we had in the other one. But the idea here is this is actually going to show up and do something. So I'll post these to the web pages. Let me go and run the server first. All right, so there's the server. The server's up and running. And I'm going to put the server on this side up here. Let me move it so you can see the whole thing. And now I'm going to move this window uh, down there so you can see that. All right, so there's the server. And there's some extra junk being printed out here that I had in there for debugging purposes. Ignore that right now. But notice the server's up and running. It's waiting for connections to come in. Now let me go ahead and run the client. And there's the client. And notice as soon as this ran, it joined. But you'll notice that on the server, we have the little face show up on the screen. So if I go to the client and I move it around, you'll notice it's moving it around on the server. So the server and the client are both getting that uh, input. And you'll notice that the server, when a, the client said it added player to player list, Paul, which is the name of the program that ran there, and then it tells where what address it came from and what port it came from. So that's the port it's going to talk back to my client to send the information uh, back to the thing. Now, the cool thing about this is I could actually run another client now, and it will connect to that same server. So now we'll have a multiplayer uh, experience going on. So let me go to that window and let me run another client here. So there's another client. Let me uh, minimize that. Move this down here so you can see both of these at the same time. Oops. So notice there's client one. Here's client two. And the cool thing about what, what we're seeing here, here, let me hide uh, that for a second. Notice on the server side that if this player moves, you see it move on the server. You also see it move down here on this one. So player two is going to see player one running around. Player one is going to see player two running around. So they are actually both controlling that at the same time. And if we wanted to, we could launch another one of these and have three clients on the screen at the same time, presumably. If I can find the folder here. There we go. Let me run another one. Let me minimize that. So now we have three clients. Let me put this one down here. So notice these are labeled. We've got client uh, in the upper right up here. or er, three clients, one, two, and three. And there's the server. So this one's the gray face. Uh, oops. Down here. There's the gray one. This is the orange one, or yellow, or whatever color that is. This is the green client, but you'll notice that that is uh, all of those are, uh, are working fine. And the other thing is, notice when I exit this client, notice it added them all. So if I exit this one, so let's click on this guy and hit escape. Notice it says it removed it from the list. So it automatically knew because it got that uh, exit message. Same thing on this one. Let's remove two. Now we're down to one. So one player running around. Now one thing to notice is, notice it did slow down some. We had all three of those running. That's partially uh, the server slowing down, uh, but it's also partially the uh, graphics itself slowing down because I had three Pygame instances all running at the same time. And realistically, on the server side, there's no reason to necessarily draw the picture of this thing to see it. Uh, the only reason that that is doing that right now is so we could actually see things connect to the server on the server side and do that. But the server could just be a, a console program that shows stuff up in the uh, console doesn't have to have a graphics component uh, associated with it. The other thing you could do is you could make your game itself, when you run it, you could make it act as a server to allow other uh, players to join. So in other words, I could make a game that rather than a standalone server, that all the clients connect. We could have a game that acts as a client or a server to make like head-to-head -head games. And the, the uh, kind of communication would look the same. We be, uh, as these two, it's just we would be running a simulation here on one of the two, the server side, sending out the stuff to the other client, but also running it locally. So 
uh, very uh, kind of cool, very uh, easy. One thing that we don't have in this code right now is ability to handle those lost packets. For example, if a key down or key up message gets lost, then we have something where the synchronization between the server and the client will be lost. Uh, there are ways to handle that with acknowledging things or for a simple solution to that, rather than sending a key down or key up, you could just repeatedly send the key state uh, from the client to the server. So that way, if we miss a packet like the key down, it'll catch it in the next frame and say, oh, the A is down, the A was released, or here's what's being pressed right now. The A is being pressed right now, and the spacebar is being pressed right now, and then nothing is being pressed right now. And so that's a, a solution to fix that uh, relatively easily. We lost the microphone for a second. Going back to that presentation uh, for a second, uh, let me finish up the uh, uh, server code here. So let's jump back to here. So this is what we had in our, uh, the way that we made that. We basically had send object, receive object, um, and all of the uh, using message pack was kind of embedded inside of there. And we looked at the code. Uh, we used message pack, but you could use anything you want. The protocol, we basically had just key down, key up, join, exit. Uh, but we could plan, uh, and game state, but we could plan all kinds of messages if we want to. Uh, we already looked at the other code for that. So that's all uh, that I was going to cover today. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the final exam is uh, not next Monday, but the following Monday, which is the uh, Monday, April, or May 4th. Uh, and that will be uh, done through uh, Blackboard. So look for the final on Blackboard. I will also post a final exam study guide uh, this evening. Uh, so what you probably ought to do is start looking through that, studying that. If you have any questions at all about the stuff we covered, uh, you probably want to ask uh, those by email or text message. And then also keep in mind that your uh, final project documentation, uh, source code submission, presentation submission stuff, that's all due uh, the, before the final exam. So you'll have the rest of this week, the rest of next week to both study for the final and uh, prepare for the uh, getting your presentation files done for your final project. Get all of that submitted before then and everybody will be good. Uh, so hopefully some of these special topics uh, have proved useful. There are a couple more I wanted to get to that I didn't get to uh, this semester due to the uh, kind of strange nature of what happened uh, with the remote learning and the transition to that. We lost a week there. Uh, because of that. But if there are any topics that you need covered or anything that you uh, would like to have uh, more information on or you're stuck with something or need advice, send me a message and I'll see if I can get you some uh, good advice uh, quickly if you need that for your game to work. Other than that, work on your projects, get everything working, and then study for the final. And uh, everybody should be um, prepared for the final. So don't assume that you don't need to, pre to prepare for the final. Uh, there will be questions on there focusing on the stuff we covered this semester. Uh, so just be prepared for that. So look at the final exam study guide uh, materials and make sure you get to ask questions if you have them. All right, I'll stop there for today and ask me questions if you need anything. I'm here to help and Everybody stay safe.